Dog Project, everybody. With me, as always, is my co-host, Mr. Tim Kennedy. Good afternoon. I am Dr. Mike Simpson, and very special guest with us today. Good friend of both of ours, mixed martial artist, and fellow sheepdog, Mr. Colton Smith. Hello, all you wonderful people. Good friend? I mean... Uh, how are we defining good? Like his behavior or our our relationship with him? Um, I thought I'm, it was more on a scale of one to ten type thing. Okay, so like our intimacy, our uh, I mean, how how how? What are the parameters that we're defining this? How comfortable would you be in a cold weather situation spooning with Colton? I think that's the big question on everybody's mind. I think we're good friends. Yeah, I think that's okay. that. That is a proper. No barriers. No, no, no. Barriers. Nope. I would be toasty that night. <laughs> no worries at all. I was gonna drink my Topo Chico, which is laced with a smidgen of pomegranate juice. Oh, that's delicious. I'm sure it is, my friend. I'm sure it is. So, Colton, for those that don't know, uh, Colton recently returned from his what number tour was it? Uh, third. third tour. In Afghanistan, came home safely. Thank America, you. yeah, that. yeah, combat tours are awesome. <laughs> so, so tell us what else you've been up to. You know, uh, so being a family man, I got uh, two wonderful kids, a lovely wife. We own a business, Enlisted Nine Fight Company, running the business, being an entrepreneur, fighting, training, training my soldiers, uh, training to be more lethal every day, as well as uh, soldiering uh, the same. So. That's what I've been doing. I've been gone for nine months back in the wonderful United States and excited to hit the ground running and fighting and being a sheepdog instructor and getting better and better at everything I do. And when you were over there, just, just to be clear for everybody, so you were, you were over there serving your country on the front lines protecting our freedom, but that didn't mean you gave training a back seat. You were continuing to train. I know you were you were posting it on social media. You know, both in the gi and out of the gi. You were you were training both armed and unarmed combat every day. Am I correct? Yeah. You know, my guys and I were blessed to be with uh, on a joint task force with with uh, some of the best war fighters in the world. Um, it was a a blessing. We learned a lot. We were able to uh, as well as assist a lot of people as well with hand to hand combat. Um, I'm blessed to have several soldiers that share the same sentiment as I do as far as uh, hand-to-hand combat goes and knowing that it's the most intimate form of, uh, of uh, fighting there is. I mean, it's a hand-to-hand engagement. Bottom line, I mean, you take away the tools, the weapons. Uh, Tim talks about it, hands kill. And I was blessed to be able to share my knowledge and, and learn more as well with individuals from different agencies and different uh, uh, soft community groups and stuff like that. I mean, why? I'm, I'm, I'm just going to have to go off script here, Colton. It just doesn't, things aren't computing with me in my brain. What you're telling me is, first of all, do soldiers have guns? Soldiers do have guns. Okay, that's curious. Then why, why, in, the, in God's green earth, would you need to train to act to, if you have guns? I mean, if you're always packing. You're well, packing all the time, You're bro. packing all the time, Colton. What, I mean, why? Why? Do you need to train in, in, in unarmed lethality and self-defense and combatives? This seems so unnecessary. You just like violence? What's wrong with you? Yeah, so, I mean, we have to train for the worst-case scenario, and unfortunately, a lot of people don't. A lot of people are, you know, phenomenal run, at running and gunning. Uh, they're athletes. Um, but when you get down to the bare bones, that's with no weapon or you're, you know, you're incapacitated where you can't use your weapon, your weapon's broke, your weapon malfunctions, and you get attacked. And, uh, you know, when that fight or flight response happens, that adrenaline dump happens, uh, you black out and you're not going to be able to fight. So, honestly, I think everything needs to base off of a hand-to-hand engagement. I think once that should be like your, your base, your foundation of the home should be your hand-to-hand capabilities. And then it branches out from there with your weapons training, weapon retention, into using technology which should be one of the last tools you should you should learn and hone and fascinating. Continue this, to learn this is, and hone. This is beautiful stuff here. So, um, I mean, let's just make an example here, a, a parable, if we will. Um, you said a beautiful thing. You said that the fight and flight with fight or flight, you train to fight. So, is that something that you think could be nurtured? Um, that some people could maybe get better at the whole fighting thing? And do you think that once they get better at the whole fighting thing, that translates into the other warrior aspects of being somebody that's hard to kill? Like, if you are one of those guys that's 
always packing. Yeah, I'm making fun of you if you're not catching the sarcasm. If it's not flowing through these cords and through this computer and into your brain, I'm making fun of those that would actually try to say that to us. Um, Two, three massive war fighters here that are essentially saying that you can nurture an aspect of training and it and it bleeds over and complements into other forms of being a badass. Do you, would you agree with that? Without a doubt. You know, I've been a martial arts instructor and combative instructor for a long time, and I've taken uh, timid soldiers, whether they're infantry, whatever their, their MOS is, or occupational specialty in the military or police force, and I take these guys, and beginning of the class, you know, they're very timid. Uh, they don't, they're not very assertive. Um, the way they carry themselves, uh, maybe they want to be in the back of the class. And by the end of the course, it's Sounds like me in bed, but go on. Exactly, like, like a dead fish, like Tim in bed. But no, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't know, all right? Don't ask, don't tell. But no, I mean, honestly, though, you see these guys once they graduate the course and you see just how assertive they are and just how that translates into all aspects of their life as soldiers, as civilians, as men. They become hard targets once they learn uh, these tools of the trade of being, uh, you know, in a hand-to-hand engagement and knowing how to handle yourself. With that being said, it's a perishable skill. You have to know, uh, like, like you always talk about your assets and liabilities uh, when it comes to hand-to-hand engagement and what you can and can't do. And if uh, you have bumps, bruises, injuries, um, or you haven't been training, then obviously you become a liability. So let me chime in here from the sideline. So, so here's my question. Here's a question a lot of the viewers have, like, excuse me, a lot of the listeners have. So you're talking about you're training in all aspects of warfare. You're training, you're training with your, your firearm. You talked about training in technology and everything else. And you're also training about talking in hand-to-hand combat. So you telling me, like, you get in a situation where your weapon fails or whatever it is. So you're gonna call it. Are you gonna call a tactical timeout? You guys, you you know, you're gonna hand your your opponent a gi. Are you guys gonna oil up? Uh, you know, how, how's that gonna work exactly? Yeah, absolutely. And that that's really. You gotta you gotta train like you fight, and you gotta train in the worst training case scenario. Like you fight. I want to say we've heard that before, Tim. Have we heard that before? Yep, we've heard that before. <laughs> these, these are things that are being echoing that have been echoed um, through pretty much everybody we've talked to. Obviously, Colton's another like-minded uh, war fighter, warrior first and foremost, a martial artist, um, freaking hero. God bless America. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just don't know. To so so all that cre- you're talking about training. Not not in the gi, not in a pair of Hayabusa shorts or a singlet. You're talking about training like you fight. You're talking about all the all the the soldier stuff. I'm making air quotes over here that, that we wear. You're talking about body armor. You're talking about a ballistic helmet, night vision goggles, your weapon slung in full uniform and boots. You're talking about bring it the way you're going to bring it when you actually have to. Am I right? Absolutely. You know, you don't in training as well when you're doing hand to hand, you don't want best case scenario where you're going to be in your fight shorts on a mat. You know, I understand there needs to be some kind of risk involved, and that risk could be in a shoot house, could be with full kit on as well, uh, and maybe have the assailant or whoever in impact reduction suits, but not one guy in impact reduction suit, 10 guys, and one of those guys is the assailant, one of those guys is the guy that's going to come, the terrorist, or whatever your scenario may be, maybe a workplace violence situation like we have at Fort Hood a few times, and we've definitely trained since then on Fort Hood as well. Um, and luckily, it takes something like, unfortunately, excuse me, it takes something like that for chain of command or for the higher ups to realize, man, maybe we really need to do uh, some training in this and understand. And that's another thing, another piece of it as well. For police forces, for military, no matter what you're doing, a, p- a plot of grass and some, some technique from, from a decent instructor, I mean, that's, that's better than nothing. And we talk about it a lot where police forces and soldiers don't train. You know, they go to the range once, once a year, maybe. Um, they do a PT test once a year. And they don't really hone their craft, and they call themselves war fighters. They call themselves operators or whatnot, but they don't want to, you know, utilize the base, which again is a hand-to-hand engagement. I go back to it all the time. I tell everybody all the time: the most intimate form of combat is a hand-to-hand engagement. I mean, it's take away everything we have, and that's what you're left with. You know, and that's a a huge hole I think in people's game, and, and where people can be a real liability and real really dangerous is. Those people that are out there, and, and some of them are probably listening right now, who say, I know I do. I am with you guys. I am a sheepdog. I go to the range, and, and I go to jujitsu, and, and I, you know, I, I work this, and I work that. But the question is, do you integrate? 
like you're talking about. Do you are you putting your duty belt on? Are you putting your body armor on? Are you doing it in uncomfortable situations? Because yeah, when it goes down, you're not wearing a gi, you're not wearing a singlet, you're not wearing Hayabusa shorts, you're not oiled up. You're wearing whatever you know. You're walking across the HEB parking lot or whatever you you know pulled over, did that high risk stop if you're a law enforcement officer, whatever it might be. You know, and something else to think about as well is uh, even a s- smaller detail. You talk about nutrition, what you're putting in your body. Uh, I tell my soldiers, I talk to them all the time about it. You know, you're, you're reincarnated as, as Lightning McQueen, you know, and you want to be on 87 octane or do you want 110 race fuel when you go out there tomorrow for your PT test, for your mission, for a ranger school assessment, whatever it may be. You know, of course I want 110 race fuel. You know, I want to, you know, constantly fuel my body to be optimal, especially for the, the, the profession we're in. But even... Every average, average day male should be able to defend their family, should want to defend their family, should know, you know, I put in my body uh, the most important nutrients I can put in it to be 100% fueled for the next day if there's ever a threat or anything I have to do for my family or for myself, life, limb, or eyesight, um, and, you know, hydration, just even basic to that, you know, eat crappy, at least hydrate. You know, I hate to say that, but I mean, we're going to obviously be humans, human nature, we're going to indulge in bad food, whatever it may be, whatever our vices are in life, it's going to happen. But you, you can't stack the cards against yourself, especially in, in this day and age, the volatile world out there. My, my experience on, on deployment, and I don't know how the two of you, your experiences compare, but my experience has been that, that people basically split into two groups during deployment. Is People either come back incredibly fit compared to their pre-deployment status. And, you know, they, they went to the chow hall every day and they selected that, that grilled chicken and, you know, made the healthy choices and the egg whites and everything else. Or the people that just completely fall apart and they completely indulge. Because we know there's a, the, the, the dining facilities overseas, they're plentiful and a lot of very unhealthy choices and stacks and stacks and stacks of Pop-Tarts on your way out and everything else. And that's, it, you can see it on that rotator when you're flying back. You know, the guys who like, you know, I took advantage of this downtime and I made good use of it in in the gym or on the mat or out running the airfield and made those healthy decisions in there. Um, And I I think it's real evident. I think everybody comes back either in a lot better shape or an absolute lot, lot worse shape. And it's, it's funny because you get back and the unit will go, all right, you know, there's no way we're even possibly going to think about making you take a PT test for 90 days because you're, you're post-deployment. And the fact of the matter is there's a, a, a sub-segment of people, and I know I was in that group, it's like, I'm itching to take a – if you want, you want to test me, test me right now because I'm in the best shape I've been in a year. Yeah, those are the fun times. You come back – I mean, so, you know, you work – for us, we would kind of wake up around – 4 p.m. and go to the gym. Come back, have a nice, healthy grilled chicken, or maybe even a steak. Maybe it's it's the surf and turf night, and I have four lobsters. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Post huge heavy lift session, and uh, but never trained so hard that there wasn't enough in uh, in the tank to defend the castle. So. I train hard in the in the pre mission workout. Then I'd eat. Then we'd start mission prep. Um, then we'd go to work and would work for seven eight hours. And then we'd come back. And then I'd really get on. Then I'd really get on it. My second workout of the day, um, post mission around six seven in the morning. And uh, man, when, when I'd come back from deployments, it was just anybody anywhere anytime. I was like itching like. Give it a whirl. PT test me. Oh, you want to do a? You know, it's it's uh, you're 100 percent right. But there are, um, I think, the further up the spear you go, the less of the lazy guys there are. Um, the more guys are, are motivated. Now, was actually one of the one of my questions to Colton was, um, I've never in this new era of the millennials that are coming into the army and um you know the video game era of kids that have come in like i i've I've, i don't know anything about the army i don't you know like i couldn't imagine you said my soldiers like you have these privates that are coming in that uh you know they're born in 2000 and they were given a PlayStation when they were eight. You know, they, they got participation medals. They uh, Their dad was like, man, that was really great. You know, that was a good shot. I mean, you missed, but that doesn't matter. You took the shot, you know? And like, in my world, man, if I, if I shot and I missed, that was just a 
I'm getting beaten, you know? Um, so what, how, I mean, General Mattis is back. So we got that going for us, but <laughs> how, 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 how are you shaping your soldiers and how's that going? So it's very, it's, it's difficult right now. I mean, obviously we're in a different time. Uh, I hate to say that, but it definitely, uh, hopefully it's a vicious cycle that'll, uh, uh, turn back around and get to where where it used to be, but it's it's problematic right now for leaders. Um, if we don't, if we can't adjust as leaders to the, the changing societal norms uh, as they are with the with the military, uh, kind of adopting those. Whether I agree with it or I don't agree with it, I have to if I want to keep ahead of the curve and keep getting promoted and keep uh, you know excelling in my career. However, I find it very difficult. Soldiers nowadays they get to wear soft shoes for the first six weeks of OSIT as infantrymen. They wear soft shoes. Uh, it's like three, three to six weeks, something like that. They wear soft shoes now because of all of the issues they have with boots and their, their weak, frail bodies. Like you said, the, the millennial mindset of video games and um, woe is me type mindset. Um, and, you know, in, getting these new soldiers in, I've seen it. I'm not going to uh, obviously say my soldiers or anybody else's soldiers, but a bunch of soldiers coming in from base training and failing PT tests right when they get to the unit. How on earth... Does an 18, 19, 20-year-old kid fail a PT test? When I was, I mean, I, I still, I, I've, I've maxed every single, not to my horn here, but I'm 29 years old, I've maxed every single PT test, but the very first one in basic training, because they won't, won't let you max it. Like, it's not going to happen. They're, you know. So, I mean, every single one of them since that one, I have, and I'm not saying I'm some specimen freak, however. You are a specimen. I'm, I'm you know, I work myself extremely hard, and I expect my soldiers to do the same, because I do it for them as well, and exceed the standard as a leader, but... Uh, it's very difficult right now to navigate that because you have these young men that when you were 18, 19, 20 years old, I mean, you can only imagine, you can run circles around yourself now, and we're still you know, in, the, in, the, in the shape to, to score a 300, which is the perfect score in the APFT, Army Physical Fitness Test. Um, it's a leadership challenge. Uh, I think that I've done a good job myself with my soldiers. Uh, I've utilized actually one of our friends, Atomic Athlete, uh, with their programming with my soldiers, and um Use them to to ramp up their their cardiovascular system, their strength system, and kind of build that that base instead of killing them right off the bat with 90 pound rucks and running around crazy and shin splints and everything else. Doc can probably speak on that more, but I think it's oh, the biggest I, thing that I I've done. Scars from it, believe me. Yeah, that I've that I've had to do honestly is is uh, kind of build them up myself once I got them. Like, they were brand new young pups, and I had to teach them and bring them up into the Colton Smith way, but. Uh, you know, and some of them broke, some of them quit, some of them sent to other platoons or sent to lesser jobs because they can't hang. But that's just the nature of the beast, unfortunately. So in in a cycle, um, one of my friends, Tate Fletcher, fr- friend of the podcast, um, brilliant a philosopher in, in my opinion, um, he, he put something out. He said, hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. And then weak men create hard times. In that cycle, where do you think we are right now? I mean, weak men. I mean, the weak men are created. Have we bottomed out? I I sure hope so. I hope we bottomed out because then then we can look up. I mean, you, once I, you hit I rock bottom, see us on hard times, definitely. So that I mean, if if this is uh, hard times, um, we got hard men coming finally. Hopefully, I've been uh, which like positions us well uh, to shape and create what those men look like. You know, like I I think. You know we're full force multipliers. You know we our, our our job is to penetrate not only a single person or a single city or a single department, but we're supposed to effectively change a culture, a culture that has been impotent, a culture that has been weak, a culture that has been, um, I mean, just trudged upon for the past twenty years and. And they've accepted that. And I, I think that we are, I'm hoping that we're taking this turn. I'm looking at our nation and I'm seeing where we've been for the past 8, 10, 12 years, even 15 years. And I mean, from 9-11 on, it's gotten worse and worse and worse and worse. Um, but then I look across the sea into the Atlantic and it's still getting worse there. And we're not as bad as it is there, you know, in, in um, the Cologne Germany's and the Sweden's and uh, Paris. Uh, I'm hoping that strong men are going to be coming back. You know, right after 9-11, I thought we saw we saw a move towards the right direction. And we had talked about it. You know, 
I I had been in the army a while when when 9/11 occurred, and we had already talked about. Yeah, I know you make fun of me all you want, but we we had already talked about. It. We used to call it the Pepsi generation. You know, that was before there was such a thing as millennials or anything else. We talked about you know the the younger generation. You know, the this the same type thing. Uh, it was shortly. Uh, Shortly after I went to basic training was when the you know that's in airborne school. When I went to airborne school, we were still running in boots, and it was shortly thereafter that they stopped that. They said, "No, there's there's no reason to, to run in boots. You're going to run in tennis shoes." And you know we we saw this this continued weakening of the armed forces. And then in 9/11, it it was like, wow, you know, all we needed was a war. All we needed was a fire lit under us to move in the right direction. And you know. Guys like Tim, who even had who had other choices, started started coming in. You know, it was it was the 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 call to the warriors to come in and to to reshape it. And we 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 really did. We started to move in the right direction. But I don't know if it's generational, or if it's leadership, or a combination of all those things. You know, or just that you know we as a as we call it a fast food society, just our attention span. You know, the the fact that you know this. This was not a war that was just going to be a couple of years. This is a generational war, and that people just couldn't stomach that idea and and turned away from it and and started to get soft again. I don't know what the answer is, but I you know I I've, I've seen it, you know probably as much as you have. You know Tim has been sheltered from it uh, because he's never had to be out of soft at all. You know you've had to be in the big army. I've had to be in big army medicine, which I think in, in some ways is worse. And you know you talk about PT tests. I retired last September. I was 50 years old. I was on a permanent profile for multiple reasons, you know, that, you know, ultimately, you know, gave me my disabled status when I, when I got out. And uh, physically, I was barred from doing a regular PT test. And they said, okay, we have these alternate events so you can, you can do the walk or you can do the, the bike or this other stuff. And I said, no. I'm going out on my shield. I have never not stepped up and done a PT test when it was required of me in all my 32 years of service. I don't care if I'm violating my profile. I'm going out of my shield, even if even if I got to crawl. And I went out there and I did it. And I'm lapping 19, 20 year olds. And I'm 50 years old running this. And I'm like, and this is ridiculous. And you're bro- also like five foot four, and you're you're five a foot ginger. Six. Five you're foot a ginger six. troll. Do not take those two okay. inches away from me. <laughs> so we have like a 50 year old, five foot six, troll ginger that's crushing 19 year olds. Um, do we have a chance, Colton? Do, we, <laughs> I, 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 I think, do I have hope for the Army? I think we do. And, okay. and I'll say this. Last week I was in a town hall with uh, Force Com Command Sergeant Major, Command Sergeant Major Schroeder, who I know very well, Ranger Qualified, 101st Cat from forever ago. Been deployed ah, ah. several times, you know, and uh, super, super motivated guy. If you got in trouble on post, you and your whole entire chain of command go and do pain train PT with him. And they're talking, they're talking about a 50-something-year-old man that can – run laps around my soldiers as far as PT goes. You know, he's a command sergeant major, definitely leads by example. And uh, definitely a change right now with with thing, with, with, with Mattis in the house, a few other g- uh, key generals that got pushed up. Um, Millie, General Millie, our, our um, ch- uh, the Army Chief of Staff right now, General Millie, amazing man uh, as far as being a warfighter goes, and he holds that to very high, high regard. Uh, but listening to Sergeant Major Schroeder talk about, hey, listen, if you're a platoon sergeant, you're a sergeant first class in the infantry, and he kept saying infantry. There's a bunch of other MOS in there, but he kept saying infantry because, I mean, face it, they're they're the ones that are where the rubber meets the road, kicking indoors, winning wars. And he was talking about the infantrymen. If you're a sergeant first class, you're in the infantry, and your soldiers are out PT and you can't because you're broke, guess what? You're going to the S3 shop now. Like, this isn't three, four years ago where you're just going to ride it out to retirement or until you make your, your EA, then you're going to be a broke uh, E8 at that point as a first sergeant, you're going to take your time, heal up in the S3 shop. Yeah, it might delay your career, but we have a, a we have wars to win. We have war, you know battles to fight as infantrymen. And I love that he said this, you know. And and I I believe the guy. I, I've I've worked with him a few times in my career, and uh, he seems to kind of be the kind of guy's man of his word. A few years ago, I don't think we'd hear um, an individual say that. I don't think he'd be he'd probably get fired to be honest with you i hate to say that but he'd probably get fired if he's a general or a high-ranking uh, general level command sergeant major telling you hey you're going to the s3 shop raise your hand if you got a permanent profile if you're you can't rock with your soldiers you know half the room raise their hand it's a bunch of it was all senior ncos and he's like all you guys are going to go to s shops if you're not if you're on the line right now it's wrong you know we're doing you a disservice doing your soldiers a disservice and that's guys like that 
that I feel they've accomplished enough in their lives where I, I honestly believe that he'd be content if they said, you know what, you're out of line, you're retiring today. He'd be like, all right, Roger, whatever, I'll retire today. Um, but I, I like that he didn't, you know, one of those guys didn't sell their soul that'll be honest with you about where you need to be and uh, who needs to be leading the charge right now uh, in, in America, you know, on the battlefield. So that uh, gives me hope for the future. Senior leaders like that that have been around forever uh, that honestly care about the warfighter, that's, that's what, you know, is keeps me in the uniform, keeps me serving when I, I don't have to. You know, I'm not in death yet. I could still get out. I stand because of seniors like that that I look to emulate as I climb the ranks. Yeah, I think one of the problems has always been in the military, and you see this in law enforcement, you see it in firefighters, you see it in paramedics, you see it in a lot of lines of work, is people who've been around for a while who might have been just shit hot out of the gate when they were younger they might have been the you know the greatest thing since sliced bread you know they were the you know they were the best fire team leader or the best squad leader or whatever it is or maybe they were that that guy right out of the police academy who you know took somebody down or did something amazing and they've gotten older and they've gotten a little bit softer and they they can't keep up anymore but you know the the thing i you always hear oh yeah yeah but he's a good dude yeah, he, yeah, but he's a good dude. He's good. I know a lot of good dudes. I know a lot of good dudes. I wouldn't want all of them lining up in the stack with me to go in a door. So, you know, you have to make that differentiation. You know, there were guys I knew in group who were who were good dudes. And, uh, you know, I'd sit down and have a beer with them. But they, they stuck around. You know, they stayed at the dance a little bit too long. And, and they couldn't do the job anymore. And it was time for them to move on. And uh, some of them would go... Some of them go to those jobs and heal up, like you're talking about. Some of them would go to those jobs and hide out, you know, and then and then pop back around when they got promoted or whatever it was, and that that was a problem. And you know, it, we see it in all lines of work, but it's not, you know, if it's if we're talking about the office somewhere, you know, or the warehouse somewhere, that's probably not that big a deal, you know. When it's oh yeah, he doesn't work as hard as everybody else, but he's a good dude. Okay, but when you're talking about a profession where lives are on the line, I don't care how good, you know, you need to say, is him being a good dude and me not wanting to hurt his feelings, wh- is that enough to sacrifice four other individuals? Is that enough for me to ter- tell four women that they're now widows because, because he couldn't keep up? And uh, those are hard decisions to make. And I'm glad there's some solid leadership in place that's willing to make those hard decisions because... That has always been, it's been a problem even in SOF to, you know, tell people, you know, you need to hang it up. You know, you're, you're not team sergeant material or you're not, you're not SIF material anymore, whatever it might be. You need to move on. You need to go to a tour somewhere else. You need to consider reclassifying to a different job because you cannot do this anymore. And those are decisions that have to be made. I'm glad somebody's in place that's going to make those decisions. I have three questions, Colton. Um, no, has nothing to do with what's in my fu- in my hand right now, so don't worry about it. Um, first, I need I still need a soldier that can set up my dress blues. Do you, do you know somebody? Uh, I, Tim, I may know somebody. I did spend uh, two years in the old guard, okay. so uh, I could definitely set your uniform up for you. For there's like ribbons and stuff that go on there, and correct. And then there's, there's like your some shiny thing. And your name, this your is, name goes on there. This is correct. And, uh, like, I don't know. Not my name, your name. My name. Okay. Correct. Isn't isn't (laughs) there, there's a sword. Isn't there a sword? I was led to believe there would be a sword. I have a sword. I have an, I have a proper NCO sword. NCO sword. There Uh you go. Has my name carved on it. Can I, is there a way I'm allowed to wear that with my uniform? You're Tim Kennedy. I think we'll, we'll make an exception. Well, let's say um, I'm not Tim Kennedy and I'm going in front of people that have, that would not know or care who I am. Um, would that sword be a, a an asset or a detriment to, to it would <laughs> to probably be a detriment to your to your career okay okay that's good to know okay good 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 response to my first question second question um mike asked if it was cold we're in a cold weather environment and we had to stay warm are we good friends we are the best of friends. Okay, that's good. Yes. All right. Um, third question. What? What? So what's what's next for Colin Smith? It's really weird that you just left that one hanging there. It's, <laughs> <laughs> that makes me. So I'm I'm glad I got to be somewhere, and I'm not going to be around for whatever's happening. <laughs> um, 
what's what's on the docket for the I mean, not like this year hasn't been something already um, come on as a uh, sheepdog instructor, a massive training partner for me, good good year in the fight department for you, crushed some souls, and then you went and hopped on a plane, flew overseas, and, and uh, took your pet screaming eagle with you, and he's like, ah, freedom! I mean, that's, uh, that's a, that, that was a bald eagle. That translates loosely <laughs> into freedom. I'm not sure if you know that. Did you know that? I'm glad you speak eagle. <laughs> yeah, I'm I glad do. I'm okay. Um, I can. You want to hear Liberty? Like, Please. What's that sound like? Ah! <laughs> that was Liberty. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. <laughs> um, if you get, um, so, like, lay, lay out. You got back. You've been gone nine months. Um, your 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 wife found a dude named Jamie, and uh, and left you and kicked all your stuff to the curb. <laughs> no, so what? I mean, what's if, if you all don't know, that's actually like a thing. But fortunately, Colton's wife's amazing, so she's still around and didn't hook up with a dude named Jamie, who we would have to bury. But yes. <laughs> so what, what's what's coming up? So uh, initially, when I was coming back from Afghanistan, I was going to go do Best Ranger in April. I had the Best Ranger competition coming up. And uh, that is not going to happen, unfortunately. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop you right there because you're going to, you're going to. I, I want right now people are at home googling Best Ranger, and I want, I want everybody at home to know what a huge deal that is. So Best Ranger, that's that's like, you know, uh, imagine the America Ninja Warrior uh, with like a John Wick type spin on it. I mean, that's that's the ultimate. Ultimate. Imagine, you know, the Ultimate Fighter, which you've already been on, uh, you know, plus John Wick, plus American Ninja Warrior, plus a Sheepdog Response Course, like all rolled into one. I mean, no, that, seriously, in, that in is the, everything. In it's, the th- in the in in the three days that normally that you go straight through the Best Ranger competition, you do what's essentially a Tough Mudder, you do a marathon, um, you do a Gladiator Challenge, you do a Sheepdog event, you do. Um, you do a precision parachute drop, yeah. which is not – and the way you do that, the time doesn't end until – you know if you land where you're not supposed to land, then you're running to get there. Sleep deprivation, food deprivation. Sleep deprivation, I mean, food deprivation. You're uh, swimming, making poncho rafts, so making a raft out of ponchos with your rucks and all your equipment in it. You're doing a Prusik climb all the way up to that ridiculous rappel tower, which if you've never done a Prusik climb, that's a smoker. Yeah. So are you a sadist? What's wrong with you? Why would you do that to yourself? Yeah, you know, so I was actually, I was voluntold by my regiment to go and do an assessment while in Afghanistan. I flew, did an assessment, and didn't train for it, but I was at altitude this deployment, uh, and uh, went and did it on like five days notice, smoked everybody, and my partner smoked everybody, the guy that was going to be my partner, and uh, he's done Best Ranger twice. Both of his partners have gotten injured during Best Ranger, so he wasn't able to finish higher than, I think, eighth. Um, so that's what we were training for. Come back from Afghanistan. I mean, so I mean, um, oh my God, sorry, I got, I got lost there. Um, you, you said you were training with this guy, and um, you never. Yeah, it wasn't going to be me because I wasn't with you. <laughs> so I mean, who is this other guy? Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I just want to. I, I just kind of need to know I, maybe his name. I'm feeling a pang of jealousy. I know. <laughs> Uh, so uh, yes. who's this? Who, who's this other person? So Sergeant First Class Ski, if you're out there listening, uh, talk about. The most you you check this dude out. You look at him like, oh, pfft, I'm gonna run circles around this dude. And this dude's just one of those guys that has kind of the dad bod going on. All right, the vet bod, however, is the dad bod with some knee pain. So he has a vet bod going on. He's like, you know, mid 30s, been in the infantry for a long time, just salty as hell. But the dude runs circles around all these other like Ranger qualified lieutenants that were like, you know, athletes in college, where you know whatever university, West Point played football and he smoked all of them as like a you know mid 30s which isn't that old okay Tim I'm not trying to make fun of you and Doc it's over quite here young, but actually. but uh yeah Sarn Ski is uh the anomaly I think he may not realize he's already dead but he's he's still there <laughs> pumping you know that that kind of guy I hate this guy whoever he is <laughs> um and uh there I mean there's a lot of little things that you said in there that kind of stung you know <laughs> that uh that hurt. So let's just go on. Uh, just let me take a second here. All right, let's just go on with what you have. Tim needs uh, a tactical timeout. Yeah. What else is coming up for you? All right. Um, so with uh, not doing best ranger with somebody else. Yes. 
So fighting wise, I'm on a four fight win streak um, against four pretty good opponents, all from Wilters of Fighting, Bellator, Legacy, one of those top organizations. They're all veterans for that. And, uh, you know, looking at fighting John Fitch this year, that'll probably be postponed or Fitch might retire. That's probably not going to happen. Um, so I'm just going to keep training to whoever comes and gets that World Series of Fighting title while I'm out training, doing other things, uh, being a sheepdog instructor, being a soldier still, obviously, and an entrepreneur with my lovely wife. And again, when I say entrepreneur, I may be classified as an entrepreneur, but I don't do anything. She does everything. I literally sit there with crayons and color while she is uh, wheeling and dealing. And, and uh, yeah, she's an amazing woman. Megan, you're amazing. I love you. So i got to add that in there. So, and, uh, so hold the phone. So you mean to tell me that you're a soldier protecting our freedom, deploying to Afghanistan, but you're still a professional mixed martial arts fighter? It's wild, I know. I know, Mike. No, how, how I, much, I am. How much is enough for you? And a lot of people look at that like, hey, man, you should get out. I've had people in the Army, like some of the, the best commanders and, and NCOs I've had uh, in charge of me or peers or subordinates even, like, hey, what, are you going to get out? Are you gonna, are you going to chase this dream? But as Tim knows, um, you know, fighting uh, is very lucrative for a short amount of time, and you're only as good as your last fight or your last in- injury, car accident. Um, you know, and that's one of those things that – with me being a family man and also being indebted to my soldiers and people that I've led, people that I've lost as well in combat, um, it's one of those things where I still have a dream in my heart to exceed the standard as a non-commissioned officer in the military, but as well as be a world champion one day in fighting simultaneously. And is it the best case scenario for an athlete? Maybe not, but I feel like it gives me the edge. I feel like uh, I'm up at 5.30 in the morning doing PT with my guys. I guarantee my opponent, 99% of opponents, 99% of professional fighters, just got done playing video games. They're going to sleep till 1400 in the afternoon before they wake up and finally. Uh, That's you know, 2 p.m. Right. 2 p.m. 1400. Okay. 2 p.m. Sorry, 2 p.m. Just declare. I'm sorry. We got, we got a <laughs> army army that to times. Tim. But the the big point that I'm making there is, I mean, it, it, for all these people out there that are making excuses about how they just don't have time or they can't do something, you know, and I'm talking about so soldiers who say, well, I, I have a full, I'm a full time soldier. I I'm too busy to go out and train martial arts. I can't do I can't work that into my schedule. Or a businessman or businesswoman that says, well, I just don't have time to do that. Or a mixed martial artist who says, well, I just can't make weight because there's just too much going on. And I'm not, I'm going to be the first to say, okay, I've never been a professional fighter. I've never had to make weight. But I'm saying no matter what life you're in, there's excuses to be made and excuses that I have heard. And I, what I'm hearing from you, what I've heard from both of you, is that you can be an active duty soldier, you can be working full time, because neither one of you is working that, that cushy S3 job, that cushy arms room job. You're both deployed, deploying still as warriors while at the same time being professional fighters. So I just want everybody who's out there listening to this that has made some excuse why they can't do something in recent memory to think about that for a moment and think about how incredible that is. Just get off your ass. Seriously. Here, just get up right now and do some push-ups. Was I, was I too politically correct? Yeah, you're being super sweet. Sorry, sorry. It's, yeah. the, it's the doctor in me. The only, like, right now, the two voices that you hear, Colton, say something. La, la, la. That's, the, that's Colton's voice. Um, two dudes that have only dudes to fight at the highest level ever in mixed martial arts history while simultaneously being active duty. Colton won the Ultimate Fighters Challenge. Like, he won tough and then went on to have an awesome career, now still having a run of wins that just got back from Afghanistan. Um, I, I s- sucked. So, um, yeah, get off your ass. Drink some water. Take a knee, face out. Then do some more push ups. Change your socks. Yeah, do but, something. But, but honestly, though, Tim's right. Like, check this out. I mean, I tell us people make the best. You know, the best case for yourself. I mean, I don't care what your opponent's doing. I don't care what your arena is, whether you're a freaking LARPer, whether you're a fighter, whether you're a, a triathlete, a, a CrossFit athlete, or if you call them that. <laughs> no, but honestly, whatever you do, be the whatever best LARPer you arena, can be. be the best you can be and make the best scenario for yourself. I don't care if you're a fighter and you train out of a garage. I'll tell you this right now. My first, I had, what, eight, eight amateur fights and my first four or five pro fights. I went to the field. I still was an infantryman, still uh, you know a, a team leader, squad leader, platoon sergeant, 
and I was literally lifting ammo cans in the middle of Fort AP Hill, Virginia, uh, training for a fight when I was coming out of the field on a Thursday, weighing in on a Friday, fighting on a Saturday, and I'm out there, you know, all week lifting ammo cans and shadow boxing, doing push-ups and sit-ups, and that's literally my first, like, 13, 14 fights in my career that I only lost one of, uh, split decision at, like, light heavyweight. But that literally is how I train. I train maybe twice a week if I was lucky at an actual gym. That, I mean, that's literally just me making the best case for myself. I mean, everything I can do possibly physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, I was doing, making the best of my situation. Screw what your opponent's doing. I don't care what they're doing. As long as you make the best of your situation, you're going to be successful. Amen. I just got a freedom boner. <laughs> and that, no, and I'm gonna that's say what that sounds like. I'm gonna I'm gonna say boner and, and eagle. <laughs> it's slightly more guttural. <laughs> <laughs> it starts low and then it goes high and it stays high. Get it? I get it. Okay, yeah, <laughs> doctor. It. I, think, it? I, I think everybody got that. <laughs> if you can see it, I was visually um, giving cues with my right arm with a fist raised at a, about I don't know 60 degree angle from my hip. You, you could post that on Instagram to clarify, but I think everybody <laughs> okay. pretty much gets the point. So, um, so on top of all this, you're a sheepdog instructor. I mean, you're not just a sheepdog in every way, shape, and form. You're a sheepdog instructor. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's one thing that's very near and dear to my heart is teaching. Teaching not only martial arts, obviously, but if out of a thousand people that I, that I train, if they, you know, are force multiplier on the battlefield or on the street or they save a life – or, you know, uh, take a life, I mean, in, in, in a obviously a legal manner, then my job is successful. And every person I've ever trained in, in martial arts, combatives, hand-to-hand, as a sheepdog instructor, if I'm able to give one man or woman, the com- or child, the confidence to step up and be a force multiplier and either de-escalate a situation and save a life or, or take a life accordingly if that's, that's what the you know, situation dictates. But... That alone is what I, why I do it, and I feel like that's my calling. I, I love instructing. I love coaching. I love uh, to teach, coach, and mentor. I mean, that's literally the, the building blocks of being a non-commissioned officer in the military is teach, coach, and mentorship of not only your subordinate leaders but your subordinate soldiers. Having been taught uh, by both of you and having rolled with both of you and knowing both of you as I do, both Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu black belts, modern army combatives black belts, warriors in every sense of the word i i don't know if people out there really understand you know i I, i've been doing this type of thing my whole life and every time i get on the mat with you guys every time i go to the range with you guys i'm learning something new and to anybody out there who's on the fence about maybe going to a sheepdog course you know this is this is from a guy who spent 32 years in the military and i've trained with the best i've deployed with the best and I learn something new. I feel challenged every single time that I train with these two guys. So I hope people will just take advantage of it. I have a, uh, not to put, quote on the spot, but I have, I have something I want to ask you. Oh, yeah. So um, we have a nonprofit, the 501c3, which is the Sheepdog Survival Fund. And our mission is to supply military and law enforcement with the training and equipment that most prepares them for their jobs and their lives, essentially to make them hard to kill. Um, We have some kind of powerful people that you normally have on boards that are part of it, and we have the law enforcement representation. Um, I'm wondering if you would be okay with being our military advisor and our board member on the Sheepdog Survival Fund board. That'd be phenomenal. Absolutely. You know, I mean, working with working with the Sheepdog has been an amazing experience. I mean, obviously, the platform that you guys have created and uh, to where people can really think outside the box and know how to hone their craft and, and not be a soft target. Um, it's definitely right up my wheelhouse. Obviously, uh, Tim, without getting all soppy, has done a lot for me in my not only my military career, my fighting career, but as a person, as a friend as well. And uh, I'd be honored. And uh, if you guys, you guys can't see us, obviously, but Tim's on his knee right now asking me if I'll do this, handing me a Glock. So thank you very much, Tim. It's, it's quite... It, it, it's quite moving. This it was really a moment. It, this, we this is, have had a moment. I'm, I'm welling up just a little bit. What was the boner? The equal boner? Ah! 
<laughs> guttural going high. I know it sounded slightly different. I think I think you need to check your eagle translation. That just, that, I don't think I do not think that word means an eagle what you think it means. <laughs> uh, all right, so we're gonna have a good year. Colin's gonna be training, looking for fights. Um, he's gonna be teaching with us. He's gonna be training soldiers. Um, hopefully not leaving us again for a minute. Um, maybe doing a. We we have a pistol one on sheepdog about how to get better to shoot maybe we do a a how to get hard to stab or kill um unarmed lethality video with uh, you and me we put it out there that'd be fun um it's well, gonna be a good year good stuff it's yeah. gonna be a phenomenal year how do you think your uh medical course is going uh i think it's going great huh. yeah second day uh, I'm exhausted. I'm surprised I still have a voice. People learn stuff. People pulling me aside on the breaks and at the end of the day telling me how much they're learning. And just the, the thought that people are going to go out there better armed to save a life, you know, to save someone, which is what a sheepdog has to be prepared to do. I'm just, uh, I'm just glad to be part of it. I'm glad that, uh, I'm glad that my, all my years of training, aren't just going to go to waste. You know, I can still be, I can still serve. I can still be useful. I can still impart that knowledge on others. And even, even when I get old and just completely broke, you know, people can use all the skills and learn all those lessons that I've said time and again. These have been paid for in blood. And people need to be using this knowledge. As, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your perspective. Thank you for your service. Um, but I would like to sometime dive. We we say this thing like, man, you just got back from protecting our freedoms. I want to go down that rabbit hole. I want to talk like people ask me all the time or, or say, Tim, thanks for your service. You know, thank you for fighting for our freedom. You know, and I was like, you know, I've put a lot of people in the ground, and uh, I don't know if I actually did anything for your freedom. I'm not saying I helped a corporation get oil. That's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying I helped KBR or Hal Burton get a contract, you know, but this is a, it's, it is a complex thing. I know the people that I put on the ground that I buried were bad people, but I don't think it's that easy. I think sometime we have to maybe have a few glasses of whiskey and then, and then uh, go down this com. I mean, what would really be a philo- philosophical perspective into what, does it actually take to be free? You know, as a guy that just got back, as um, Colton's sitting here, uh, myself, who's been, you know, you can't count on both my hands and feet how many times I've been over, and Mike, who's had 30 plus years in this, that'd be a fun, that'd be a fun um, panel discussion. Uh, maybe it might be depressing, or it might be, I don't know, I'm curious. Yeah. Well, you know, the age, the age old question has always been, you know, can you have. You can't have un you can't have full security and unlimited freedom. You know, and and how much of that are you willing to trade off? And that is a, a very philosophical discussion. I think it's one that our audience is ready for, so I do think it's one that we should have. Um so everybody keep listening to the Sheepdog Project and look forward to that. Philosophizing with the old TK and with Colton Smith over some whiskey, talking about what freedom means to us and you know what what is it to truly be free? Yeah. The, um, maybe we'll grab somebody outside because we, we, the three of us would have a similar perspective. Maybe we grab a Tate Fletcher or a, or a Joe Rogan um, and Aubrey Marcus. Um, almost that contrast. But uh, I'm looking forward to this. I would love to have the contrast. I always, you know, I, me, like you, and like you, Colton, I, lo- I love talking to people that come from totally different backgrounds, have totally different perspectives, and, and having these intelligent conversations with them. You know, I'm, I'm all about doing that. Colton, Tim said it. I'm going to say it too, man. Thank you, my brother, for being here. Much appreciated. Thank you for your service. Thank you for coming home safe so we don't have to worry about you anymore. <laughs> Where can people find you on social media? Yeah, so I'm on Colton Smith MMA on Twitter, Colton Smith MMA on Facebook. I do not have an Instagram. However, my business does. Enlisted Nine Fight Company on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Please check me out. I check my messages. I'll hit you back. Send some hate. I don't care. Whatever it is, I'll still check you back. God bless. Thank you so much. 
And Tim, you're you're not really on social media at all, are you? Tim, I'm not. If, if I wish people could see what Tim is doing right now, trying to get, trying to make Colton laugh on his side. <laughs> he's, he's getting doing all the social media plugs, Colton Smith MMA um, across the board. I was sitting here stroking my Hornaday reloader, first at one hand trying to get eye contact, and then two hands, um, just vertically stroking. And uh, finally, he looked over and made contact. Um, yeah, I'm Tim Kennedy MMA, like Colton. Uh, Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, Facebook, um, redbook.com, uh, scarletbook.com. Those are escort sites in case you guys want to know. TimKennedyMMA.com. Jo- joking about the last two. And I myself, uh, I am only on Twitter. I don't have a public Facebook account, and I'm not on Instagram, but you can find me on Twitter. Please do, and please follow me at Dr. Mike Simpson. That's at D-R-M-I-K-E-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Make sure also that you go to sheepdogresponse.com. Check us out there. Check out our courses. All the instructor bios are up to include Tim Kennedy's, Colton Smith's, and myself, and our plethora, that's right, I said plethora, of amazing and highly qualified sheepdog instructors that we have up there. We're also on Facebook at Facebook forward slash sheepdog response. I'm going to close today in honor of Colton's service with a quote from the late General George S. Patton who said, accept the challenge so that you can feel the exhilaration of victory. Seek that exhilaration, my friends. Go out there and be a sheepdog. You have been listening to The Sheepdog Project. Follow us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash sheepdog response. The views expressed on this podcast are those of the individual and do not represent any larger entity, public or private. 